the yeah. feature is not going to go anywhere. You know, you don't ever have to hit something. Like, you might build it up in your head and you're like, today's the day, but like, you really need to be able to listen to yourself. Welcome to Grit with Wisdom. This is the podcast that delves deep into the inner psyche of mountain bikers from all aspects of our sport in order to discover the tools and the tactics that can help us have more fun out on the trails more often. Our aim here is to help you understand what it takes to push our own personal boundaries in the sport we love from a mental and emotional perspective. Today on the podcast, I'm sitting down here post-ride with Nate Spitz. Nate is hands down one of the most creative and talented mountain bikers that I've had the pleasure of hanging out with. He's originally from New Hampshire on the east coast of the USA. Nate grew up riding bikes and building sketchy jumps, <laughs> dreaming of being able to do this for the rest of his life. He now lives and breathes that dream mountain bike in almost every day here in Squamish. He achieves this by sharing his skills and passion through working as a coach with Johan Borelli's Into the Nah, and also through a multitude of other free ride, filming, and building projects. Nate, with no further ado, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Jake. Yeah, that's a very nice intro. I appreciate <laughs> it. And uh, I, don't, I don't really have a ton to add. Yeah, I guess I moved to Squamish to go to university, but, but I also knew where I was moving and, you know, I didn't want to go anywhere else, so. Beauty, man. That was one thing we didn't quite get, get into talking about on our ride. What did you study here at Quest? I studied geology and generally earth sciences, but Quest is, <clears throat> Quest was, it was, you really had the freedom to kind of study whatever you wanted and, uh, and choose your own path. So I found, I just, I really liked the earth science courses because I like being outside and they're always cool field trips. Yeah, dude, that's so cool to hear that background. And I mean, today you're not necessarily doing geology, but you're still out there spending lots of time in the dirt, building trails, riding trails. Totally. Working with all kinds of different materials. Yeah, and talking to clients too. And it's like cool to talk to people who aren't from around here about that stuff. Yeah, It's yeah. like, I don't know, like Squamish is, it's pretty unique with its geology and, and formation history. And I don't know, I think people people are just like oh it's beautiful and, and don't really know why yeah so cool. yeah super cool that you have that background i'd love to learn more about that maybe some other time but yeah it's, sweet. It's, it's super rad man um you just took me on a fantastic little backyard lap here in squamish kind of some steep and deep and then some, some chill trails as well <laughs> totally um, really so good and speaking of dirt the dirt was fantastic um like i said to you you didn't kill me so thank you for that um it was fantastic to kind of, yeah, see we've ridden together twice now, but get a peek into like, you know, how you operate out on the bike. And like I said to you, I love following you into stuff. You've kind of got this kind of calm approach at sending some, some pretty sketchy stuff, which, you know, pleads down into some confidence for me to maybe hit some things I wouldn't usually hit. That's sweet. Um, so I'd love to, yeah, to dive into your, your background on bikes a little bit here and maybe start to understand how you got to where you are now. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about like where you grew up and, and when bikes first came into your life. Sweet, yeah. Um, so I grew up in Lyme, New Hampshire, which is a small town near Hanover, which is also a small town, but it's where Dartmouth College is. And um, I grew up ski racing. So I, about five or six, I would like, I knew I liked going fast and like flying through the air. That was like what I wanted to do. So, uh, <laughs> so in the summer, it basically, you know, there was all this time not doing that. And none of the, like, you know, we played soccer, we played baseball, whatever, just like goofed around. And, um, but biking was like that one sport that kind of translated to the skiing field. And my friends and I would just build jumps or we had like some plastic jumps, but yeah, we would just hit these plastic jumps in the driveway and then build some dirt jumps in the backyard and just like all day just be hitting the jumps um and then you know kind of the natural progression you just just keep building build them bigger and then when i turned 11 or 12 i got a dump truck load of dirt for my birthday nice. <laughs> <laughs> and like i built one massive jump out of it just like one big step up that eventually became just a huge gap jump and i just practice hitting it every day and if I didn't hit it, I'd have to like rebuild the whole lip because it was way too steep and sketchy right. to like hit if you hadn't hit it the day before. 
So that, that process of building and learning about jumps, shaping, all that stuff started pretty young. Yeah, yeah, I did a ton of that when I was a kid and we built trails, we built jumps, like classic kid stuff. Some of it works, most of it doesn't, but yeah, you fantastic. definitely get an eye for sort of doing it and watching all the bike movies from, you know, this area and surrounding trails in BC. It's just, I, I knew I wanted to come here. Right, so that really. seed was planted pretty early on. Totally. Yeah. And the terrain, I guess if you got a dump truck load of dirt for your birthday, the terrain was pretty flat, like in your backyard to start with. Totally. We had like some sort of small hills, um, not far at all, like pedaling out the door. Right. But there was no like real bike trails, some hiking trails, like an old, you know, double wide snowmobile trail. Yeah. But yeah, we kind of had to build our own stuff. We'd go ride the like steep dirt piles over at the at the dump next door and fantastic yeah yeah it was cool but yeah my yard very flat like I had to pedal into the jumps <laughs> yeah I find that really interesting because I think it well I can really see it in your style of mountain biking today you've got this crazy bag of like flatland tricks and style yeah and I'm curious do you, yeah do you think that came from just messing about as a kid in like mainly flat environment you mentioned you had some some steps outside your local library that was kind of like the only the only yeah. drops in town yeah exactly yeah. like um there wasn't much for like drops or you know like my yard had jumps we my dad and I built some like sketchy drops off of the like one little bank in the back that had some some vertical relief um <laughs> but like you know always pretty much like just like jumping off something that's pretty much a flat landing with like a little bit of dirt so yeah 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 lots of uh lots of just time pedaling around with with my friends and stuff and yeah jumping off whatever we could so I think just time spent on the bike kind of leads to like those sort of playful like wheelies and goofing around and maybe more so with, you know, sort of less terrain to, to go ride. Totally. Yeah. It's like minimum terrain, maximum skill. Yeah. Still the same amount of time on the bike, just yeah, like yeah. goofy and, and playing around in different ways. Matt, I love it. It's so cool to see like what that's resulted in today. Yeah. In yeah. The style of riding you've got. Time. Yeah. You're obviously like so passionate at it and motivated to go and ride. Like you say, like every day, just time on the bike. What is it? Or what do you think it is about mountain biking and about bikes in general that makes you so passionate and motivated? Well, I definitely need to move. Like I'm pretty fidgety okay. <clears throat> or like ADHD. You know, I just like have to, I have to be moving to keep, uh, keep my brain and body happy. And so biking is like a really, I don't know, at some point I've decided that like, that's what I wanted to focus on and like spend time doing. And even though it's not easy to go ride every opportunity, you know, it's like it might be pouring rain or totally. you might be tired or whatever. It's like every time you're out there, you're never like, oh, I wish I wasn't here. You know, you're always like, oh, this is awesome. Like, so I, I think it's just kind of wanting to like live a positive life every day. You know, it's just, just get on your bike. It makes it easy. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah, yeah, getting on it is sometimes the hardest part, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Well, I can't remember many rides I've regretted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, back to the totally. house. Yeah. Man, so fast forward to today, you kind of live in the bike dream here in Squamish. You're coaching, you're riding, you're building, part of a whole bunch of filming projects. Um, wanted to dive straight in here and, and talk about one of your most recent builds. Um, yeah. It's kind of been blowing up online, the Elevator the Trail. Elevator. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to know, obviously, a lot of people have seen the video. If they haven't already, go and watch it. I'll link it in the show notes. But I wanted, I wanted to hear, like, the process from first, like, being out wherever that was in the forest and spotting this crazy-looking cliff, this piece of terrain. Walk yeah. us through the process from, like, first seeing that terrain to actually build in it and then eventually getting to ride it. Okay, yeah. So for that one, I think the, every, pretty much every time I was there, I was with, like, a group of friends. So the first time... I mean, like, I'd sort of, I'd seen that piece of terrain for a while. Like, I knew there was a huge slab off the top there, and I knew it cliffed out everywhere. And I, at first, you know, I never really thought about it. I was like, oh, it cliffs out. But then, you know, you're kind of like, oh, well, it cliffs out. Like, <laughs> that's maybe more exciting. And then I think, you know, it just sort of sat on hold. And then I was there one day, maybe two years ago, with a bunch of friends. And, um, and we actually kind of started clearing the landing a little bit and, like, we looked at it seriously and it was a big group of us so we were kind of moving hmm. logs around pretty easily and you know it's kind of too steep to really walk up but I, I got onto the bottom of it and initially I'd planned to go on the other side of there's a little tree or a, a pretty big tree there okay and I'd planned to go on the other side of it but 
that was like a smaller drop to a landing with a corner and it would have been more building yeah <clears throat> and then you know we didn't really do anything we just kind of made it possible to build sort of got an idea of what the ground was like okay and then um and then just like thinking about it, it's just like well why would you why would you go smaller when there's like this big awesome drop option yeah. right there that's like works better with the terrain anyways so. okay so like straight up bit bigger yeah just going straight off the nose going a bit bigger because once we'd cleared some of the logs it was like oh it's it actually is going to go fine like okay. it's not that much work yeah yeah and then i came back a few times on my own and like did some more figuring and whatever and then yeah i came back with friends and made it happen yeah and then like yeah I consulted with the builder who does a lot of the work locally there to make sure that we weren't gonna mess up any of his stuff because it is totally. pretty close to yeah him. yeah um so I'm curious, like for those that haven't seen it, this thing is steep. It's a super steep slab. It's going like 45, yeah. 50 degrees. It's like convex and then gets probably 50, 55 maybe. Yeah, and then there's a drop that's, how high would you say? Drops maybe 20, 15, 20 feet. 15, 20 feet, yeah. Yeah, probably 20 foot distance, but maybe not quite that tall. It's a, it's a big drop for sure. And I'm curious, like you're able to look at it from the bottom, build the landing, that kind of thing. You maybe had to look from the top. Yeah. It's not really the kind of line you can walk down and imagine yourself riding, is it? Because it's so steep. No, I had to tie a rope to the tree at the top right. so that I could like comfortably go so up. So then you, you just hang it down or you blame like rock climbing stuff? No, no, it's just holding on. Hanging like down. it's, it's yeah. almost walkable, but okay. if you fell, you, would, you wouldn't want to fall. Get so some it's nice rush. to have the rope to... Totally. <laughs> So they keep you a little more confident. right so you're edging yourself down on the rope kind of imagining what it's going to be like to ride mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then i just cleared the cleared the strip of moss so i know if i was like holding on a rope and edging down the slab and thinking about riding this drop was was there ever any doubt in your mind as you're going down there and like oh, will this work i mean i knew it would work like you know people have hit much bigger drops and and that steepness of slab is it's a little steeper than in an out burger, but there's plenty of local slabs that you can really get a feel for it okay. on. So you're kind of comparing it to other similar things you've rode and then yeah. putting all those pieces together to like, I think I could ride this yeah. new feature. It's kind of like the last uh, slab of K-Line. Okay, yeah. You know, steep, long, and then gets a bit steeper yeah. on, in that case. This one has a drop. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and then you just like, then I'd go practice. I'd ride other slabs and okay. think about like what it would be like. And then just spending enough time there. I just knew, like, I knew it would go. The scary part was knowing that I had to be the first one to ride it. Like, totally. I mean, I didn't have to be, of course, but there's, like, a bit of the, like, you know, you sort of, I didn't build the whole thing myself, but I facilitated the building of it mostly. And then, you know, someone's got to hit it first. Yeah, do you feel a bit of pressure kind of being the one that, that came up yeah. with the concept? He healthy pressure, you okay. know, not like, oh God, yeah, I don't have to do it, but <laughs> more like, okay, it's done. Like, yeah. no, that's, I'm ready. <laughs> that's fantastic, man. Like, congrats yeah. on, on opening up that feature and hitting it. It's such a rad one. Thank you. It's, um, uh, it's cool. Yeah, like I said, I'll put a link down there in the show notes so people can go and watch that one. Beauty. Uh, I'm curious, kind of like on that subject of like opening up on new lines and kind of you, you're continuing to push the bar higher and higher. I wanted to talk about this idea of like risk creep. Obviously, yeah. you're taking some insane risks out there. You're getting some insane rewards right in at, a, at an awesome level. But I'm curious, like on that topic, like how, how do you know when to say no? Um, you have to pay attention to your gut feeling. Like for me, it's I, I'm going to take the risk at some point or like take the risk. I'm going to ride the feature, but mm -hmm. I think the risk profile changes a lot depending on how you approach something. So like... You might show up one day unsure of whether you're going to ride it and kind of just go by the feel of that's like that's how i'm feeling right now about tonight it's like i'm supposed to go ride some stuff that's like already scary enough to go ride and then supposed to go do it in the dark or like we're going to go to those places you know and like yeah. once you're there then you have to like make a bit more of a real assessment generally it's based on sort of like I don't know. I always like to ride a little bit before I just go hit stuff. That way I kind of feel how I am like on and with the bike. And then, yeah, it can be pretty nerve wracking for sure. But Totally. So doing a bit of an assessment, it sounds like almost starting by, by thinking about what the plan is before you're out on the bike. Yeah, totally. And, and then checking in that the day. The feature is not going to go anywhere. You know, mm. you don't ever have to hit something like you might 
build it up in your head and you're like, today's the day. But like, you really need to be able to listen to yourself and say, actually, my bike's not working great or the conditions don't align yeah. or I'm just like not feeling it for some weird reason. Like you need to listen to that and cause you will feel it, you know, and the more you go to those places and think about those features and visualize doing it, the more you kind of are familiarizing yourself and that plays a big role in being comfortable. Totally. Like taking away as, as many of the unknowns as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can also train a little bit, you know, like making sure that you're like, bodies in good condition that you're not like nursing a broken foot while trying to like <laughs> ride like i was dealing with that this summer it was like horrible totally. trying to like ride the tour de Nord and also having an injury like that i wanted to ignore because i didn't want to acknowledge that like right i don't know so being smarter than that you know but sometimes the timing doesn't line up. So yeah, you just I guess you learn through these experiences. Yeah. Dude, I had no idea that you were riding all that stuff with an injury. Yeah, yeah, it's, it wasn't, I never even went to the hospital because okay. I like, I had like an embarrassing crash, you know, and I just like didn't <laughs> want to acknowledge that. <laughs> right. That, like it had happened, so whatever. Yeah, but you're all good now? Yeah, so yeah, all up. good. I, I just like, I don't know, I think I had like something very bruised or broken in my, in my foot, okay. in my heel. And then, um, that doesn't like inspire confidence if you have to, if you had to like bail midline or you know like a lot of these features you want to know if something is going to go wrong like what is it going to be and how how will you react like because you don't plan for that stuff but if you don't know it you're just like coming in blind you know you need to know where like what happens if you fall totally so, it's definitely like, worth having what as much information as you can have before you actually get to that point of it might you might be able to do something like move a log or like kick over a little stump or something that mm. like could make it really bad if you fell somewhere too so a bit of like risk mitigation just by like going through the area I'm not definitely. gonna put pads down probably <laughs> like it's too much effort to carry that stuff in <laughs> totally but, yeah um make do, sure you're not falling into you like can. a spiky snake pit yeah you know, that's that's kind of good. <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely worth a look. I talk about this with clients a lot of it. A lot of clients that are like, oh, let's just, let's just ride in. I'll ride it better if I don't look at it first and kind of like wig myself out. Yeah. But I think it definitely comes to a point, it, like when we get to a certain point in our riding and the, the consequence of the moves or the features we're riding goes up to a certain level. It's like, we've got to do our due diligence. We've got to take a look before we ride some of those things. A hundred percent. And there is the like being in the flow component. Hmm. But like, I think if you want to be a, like a feature rider and like drop into those bigger more high consequence moves you need to be able to get in the flow quickly and yeah. like or maybe set yourself up smart in a different way where you're warmed up you're you have like an in run that you can use to kind of be on your bike but a hundred percent you need to look at like what you're about to do otherwise you're just like putting bullets in the chamber and spinning the thing and hoping it's not that time you know like totally like no one wants to play your roulette on their bike no yeah not at all. Or like, it, it sort of works until it doesn't. But yeah. at a certain point, like the features are too high consequence to to approach in that way, for sure. Totally, yeah. And you talk about like this idea of like being in the flow. I know we've all kind of got our own description of like what that is. Yeah. What does that mean for you? Um, well, it's hard, right? It's kind of one of those elusive topics. Mm. For me though, like I try to be pretty realistic because you know, I'm often, my goals are to like ride a lot of features and do a lot of things. So, you know, I'm not, I'm still talking myself into doing these things. Like I'm not just showing up being like, oh, maybe today, maybe not. And then getting in the flow, you know, it's like you have to kind of fight for it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like it's not gonna, it doesn't always come easy to like, sometimes you just have to say, there's no reason I'm not feeling it. You know, like I'm here, I want this, I need to, I need to like lock it in and often it's just I think a matter of focus and okay. preparation making sure that like you're in the right gear you know you're, you're I think like not breaking flow is a good way to like be in the flow so okay. if you just kind of avoid you know when you go to drop in and you're like oh this is wrong oh this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong like you're definitely not in the flow if you're right. like making corrections that are just like being on your bike whereas if you're prepare yourself well you can kind of optimize your you know it only takes a second like it's a moment of just like all right here we go and then you're either I guess you're in it right yeah I really like that insight and I kind of <laughs> seen that riding with you today you know you've got a, a bike that you've just built up and you're like oh it's not quite set right you were changing a few things before we dropped in right and then once we dropped in you're like I'm riding now I'll worry about that at the bottom 
Yeah, totally. And it One was thing really at a time. cool to see. And <laughs> I guess that preparation as well, like today's ride for you was pretty chill. Um, just out riding, yeah, some backyard trails with me, but you've got like a gnarly night ride happening tonight with Remy. Well, today and was like a perfect... It was, yeah. Yeah. Like, like you say, you know, I wouldn't really be getting into flow easily on a bike that's not quite set up, right? You're kind of like making those adjustments. So it's really important to, before you do your gnarly move or whatever to like have taken the right steps ahead of time. Yeah, like you so did that pre-ride with me. You went and put some more air in your fork. You adjusted a few things. Yeah, it took now, some air out actually. Yeah, now you're set for maybe getting into that flow state tonight. Hopefully. Fantastic. So yeah. let's, let's tell the <laughs> listeners about tonight. What are you getting up to? Uh, I'm going to go ride um, with Remy Mataye. We're going to go do some night riding. He's got these awesome lights that we, we went and tested them out last week. You probably saw his video. He posted uh, the clip of the Garongo. Oh, I didn't actually. I'm going to have to go back and watch oh, it's, that one. It was crazy, man. <laughs> he rode it four times. Like, <laughs> you know, Remy, Remy likes to do stuff till he, he's, com- like, yeah. till he's happy with it. And, like, between the filming it and the... Uh, Getting the riding perfect, it often takes like at least five tries. So oh. it's it's amazing. He'll just like do a lot. It was like it was raining and dark, and he hit like we we warmed up on sauerkraut. The perspective. This is your first ever night ride, is that right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I think I've been out with a headlamp before, but I've never like been for a night ride. Okay. With yeah, like yeah. a bike light. Proper setup. Yeah. 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 Dude, that's crazy. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> It's funny, it's just like, boom, right in the deep end. There yeah, and like, how did you find it? I asked you a few questions kind of off recording that. Like. I honestly was riding super poorly. Like, I was sick. It was kind of like, I, I didn't really set myself up very well. Like, my bike needed a service, and I, like, had some worn-out bushings, and I just, like, couldn't even... My tires were really low tread. I couldn't right. grip at all. I was, like, flying off the trail. I was, yeah. like, totally not there mentally. And so I, I opted out of all those tricky moves. But um, Yeah, well, that's good to hear, right? You kind of yeah. learn from it and you're back tonight with perhaps a little bit more preparation. Yeah, a little bit more. Still nervous. Like, I just, like, don't know what I'm going to yeah. do. And for you, like, how do you, how do you describe, like, good nerves versus bad nerves? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think if you've done all your preparation and, like, you know, have set yourself up to be successful... Yeah nervousness is just like kind of your body's being highly attuned and mm. like can be translated to focus and and skill but i think nervousness if you're like really uncertain or if you're like not prepared would be like bad nervousness yeah perhaps like a warning sign that like hey yeah, sure. yeah exactly there's like butterflies and then there's like apprehension you know and like sometimes it, yeah. it's hard to know what the line is right between the two totally so do you find like self-talk comes into it for you it sounds like you're like telling yourself hey i've done the work i've set up my bike i'm prepared yes or perhaps the opposite sometimes like yeah you know i'm not really feeling this today my bike's not quite ready it's hard to say no you know it's hard to like be there and be like actually i'm not feeling it right now totally. so like removing your ego from like Yon and I are actually working on something right now, like a a risk evaluation tool. Yeah, I'm super excited to see that one. App, I was chatting yeah. with him about the idea as well. Um, but basically, like running through a lit a checklist, you know, mm. like is my equipment good? Are the conditions good? You know, am I prepared for this? Can I visualize this? Like basically, just having a bunch of things that tally up to a score, and then you can just say, oh, like you know, it's really easy to come back to a feature tomorrow or later that day even or like a week later or you know if you don't live there you come back the next time you're there like yeah whereas it's a lot harder to come back to a feature after having a big injury from like a you know there's like a lot of mental components to work through when you like have an injury or something like that so I think that it's always better to make the right call like yeah it's a really sound way of putting it like yeah perhaps sometimes it does feel really disheartening when perhaps you know you're visiting somewhere and you've really been wanting to hit this trail this feature or you're doing jump, a video whatever. with remy and well, like you it. want to yeah, break the internet time involved. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah to be like hey i'm gonna put the ego aside and, and break the internet another day yeah yeah <laughs> or just like not break myself today right yeah yeah pretty funny but it's wise words though man i, lo- I love yeah i love getting that easier said than done <laughs> totally <laughs> and 
I finally got around to watching the full Into the Nah video last night. Oh, was sweet. preparation for this podcast and that. It was fantastic. Like, credit to you, to Yolan, to all the other writers involved. Such a journey. And it was so cool seeing lots of people in, in this situation making lots of those yes or no kind of, like, high-consequence decisions. Totally. Especially in the group setting. Like, I was pretty yeah. impressed. Like, with a lot of my friends, with some people I didn't know. There were a few scary moments, but generally I was like, man, everyone made good decisions and like, you know, a few injuries, like that's, I don't want to say it's expected. It's the worst thing, like last thing you want, but you're in the danger zone all day. There's a ton of riders, you know, like 30 riders times 15 moves. That's like, what, 450 like jumps and landings. Yeah. Like Like, opportunities (laughs) for something to potentially go wrong yeah. yeah or like 450 awesome moments to go right but exactly like, well, like that was what know, like statistically it's just like 448 things that went well that day pretty much yeah so a couple other that. crashes too but like yeah. that's just mountain biking right totally I, I wanted to ask you like speaking about like having the, yeah there's 30 odd riders on each feature plus a bunch of people spectating on some of them photographers there as well like how do you go about changing your mindset on a day like that when you're performing in front of an audience versus just out riding with you and one other buddy there's a lot of build-up to that day so like you're i don't know i almost felt like my body was like really well just like already right you know i was like i'm ready to go like i'm i was like shaking but in like a very like like so focused, so tuned in. Like as soon as we wrote a few things on in and out, I was like, oh yeah, I feel good today. Like I feel strong. And I think starting the day on a good note is a good way to sort of carry the, carry the wave through the rest of the day. Cause it's a lot like, like you say, there's people there, there's like a order, there's kind of a bit of like a ton of camaraderie but a little bit of like all right i want to make sure that you know you don't just like ride the feature minimally like you want to bring a little flair or some flavor and totally i could sense that like everyone almost trying to do it slightly differently and put their own flavor on it yeah yeah, yeah totally. and that was what made I mean, the film so interesting to watch totally like those the, all those features are like standout features mm-hmm. but when you have 30 people hitting them you know it's just like another hit another hit another hit like how do you how do you stand out right how do you make that interesting totally and it sounds like you were kind of yeah like your preparation started before the day before like the warm-up lap you were you were visualizing what was going to go down and yeah i mean i was like hanging out at the rutherford like yohan and i bought a thousand dollars worth of lumber to build the landing for the double draw because we couldn't source it in time for like yeah so i just like called pemberton valley building supply or whatever and they delivered a truck and then we wow. unloaded it and <laughs> some random lads who were just driving by stopped to pull in to check out the train gap or something yeah. and ended up helping me carry like you know the whole like i don't even remember how many boards we bought like 90 boards or whatever wow. like over to the it was hilarious good so, on you so guys thanks, like, thanks guys yeah, yeah like put, <laughs> putting your own money and your own blood sweat and tears into to making the dream happen yeah but it's like we we've been preparing for a long time you know just building features and like mm. making sure things were you know like more safe as safe as they could have been with no budget and totally limited time frame yeah <laughs> and this is something i wanted to ask you on the building before do you find like your time just there at the feature being part of the build I know uh, you're obviously like sussing out the angle and working it all out in your head before building it, yeah. during building it. Do you find that helps when it comes to actually getting on the bike and riding it for the first time? So, so much. Like approaching a new feature, like, you know, you've never been there. You've never like seen a feature quite like that. Whereas once you've built something, you may have never hit it, but you visualize it mm. so much. And, and does that experience then translate when perhaps, you know, you set up to go ride a feature that someone else has built? Are you, are you looking at it through your builder's lens and like, is this going to work? Are the angles right? I mean, I, I always try and sort of imagine, like, I always try to spend a bit of time at a feature that someone else has like clearly put a bunch of time into because like they had a vision mm-hmm. for it, you know? And so understanding their vision, I think helps feel more comfortable. 
like on especially something like bigger or scarier you know like yeah yeah like hans is a good example he's built so many crazy gnarly features in town and a lot yeah. of them you can't even like stand on it because it's like a convex rock that's like way steeper than that's what blows my mind like, like i like to walk through a line and visualize myself right yeah it? so like to you when, when there's a rope hanging down off the rock and you can't walk and I'm like yeah. how does that look yeah it's uh it's a bit more of a mental game Dude, that's that's fantastic insight to hear that and i think going back to into the now like one, one of my favorite parts and talk about standout moments is like lunchtime you're there in the parking lot everyone else is eating burgers and whatever and you're like hey look at my thick jibs you're there like having fun in the parking lot showing off some skills like i do love the parking lot it's, tricks, yeah. it's so rad to see and like i wanted to ask like how important do you think those skills are for for people starting out learning or perhaps have been writing for a while like i have but still getting some coaching and and working on their writing, like how important do you think it is to go back to the parking lot and put the hours into those skills? Well, I think that often people are like dissuaded from parking lot tricks because, you know, they get called like a show off or they're like, there's not really a goal to it, but I think it's just like time on the bike is very valuable. So I think it's critical to play, like just goof around on your bike, you know, like it doesn't matter if there's, you know, you don't need to ride backwards down a small grass hill <laughs> to, like, do anything for your mountain biking. But just those little insights you might gain from, you know, doing a thousand wheelies or whatever. It's, like, I think it's very helpful, especially around here where you have, you know, like, tight switchbacks and, like, funky moves where, like, you know, like, one of the most useful moves around Squamish is, like, the nose pivot. Totally. And like turning your bike. I said it in our ride today, you were doing it on every steep corner and I had to really, really work to get my nice long bike around the corners, whereas you were kind of yeah. zipping around every one. It looked awesome and it was probably easier too because you've got that tool. Yeah, I think so. It's like a bit easier, maybe a bit more efficient. And then it's just like another tool in the toolbox. So Totally. Yeah, I love that perspective. It's something I've kind of learned the long way around and I'm now like, okay, Jake, maybe I do need to, totally. to spend the 10,000 hours in the parking lot. Or, or well, I, I think should. you do a lot of coaching. So I think when you're coaching is a good time, you know, like you're, you're not riding as fast. You're spending more time like getting on and off your bike. And then like, especially if you coach kids, you know, like, like kids just want to be goofy and have a good time. You know, you can spend, if you're clever, you can spend three hours like in a parking lot or a grassy field with like maybe some cones or just like a little curb drop or something and like totally. do well, it a hundred ways. That's so. a good point. And like kids and obviously like you spent like those 10,000, probably yeah. a million hours yeah. in the backyard, in the parking lot. Work, yeah. Working on those skills. Right. Mm -hmm. And I find quite often as adults, we're maybe more limited on time and we'll be like, right, I've got three hours. Let's go hit the trails and we on the trails for three hours. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps if we or dedicate if you're coaching, it. Like making sure that you're on your bike too. Like totally. it's important to like, yes like assess and look and everything but also like people want to be inspired and like there's so many learning styles people need to see other people do it too so definitely and like i noticed in your riding you, you joined me as i was kind of practicing my wheelies on the way back down from the trails today and watching you wheelie people will be able to watch that on my instagram later today you're, you're in so many different positions over the bike yeah yeah because of those hours but then i see that on the trail as well when you're manually in between different features and just able to be such a dynamic rider so totally it's inspiring to see Thanks, I wanted yeah. to, to talk, yeah, about the coaching. Like, tell us the story. You know, you obviously grew up skiing. You work in the winters as a, a snow guide. Tell us the story about becoming a mountain bike guide uh, here in Squamish. So, yeah, I was here at Quest University. I'd done a summer at home working construction and then two summers tree planting. And then the next year, like, my body was ruined already from tree planting. Like, I had, you know degenerated discs and like scoliosis and lordosis and like yeah so like twisting spine curved spine issues everywhere because like it's kind of asymmetrical and like i was you know i was there to make money you're paid right. per tree like yes you work you as hard work as you can um it just wasn't really the right thing for me i guess it was really fun i loved every minute of it but not every minute but <laughs> <laughs> um but so the next summer i was like gonna go tree planting but my body was already hurting this season that it hadn't even started yet and then um, I was doing my OFA 3 first aid course and then someone like it became apparent that I could get this job working as an ATV guide 
And then, so I was like, oh, sure, I'll do some guiding. That's kind of something I'd like to do anyways. And that was with uh, Whistler ATV, Black Home Snowmobile. And that was really cool because, you know, I I wasn't an ATV 4x4 person or anything, but it was like a good foot in the door for guiding. And I was like, you know what, any any job guiding is experience guiding. Sounds so, like a super fun way to pay your rent. And it was so fun. Like, we had a great time. I had I worked with an awesome crew, um, good company. And then, you know, it wasn't quite enough hours or something. So I was like, oh, I'm going to start working with Ride Hub. Okay. I, I got connected with Ride Hub through like an experiential learning course okay. um, at Quest. And then I met Sarah Archer, the owner at the time, and just kind of like built a bit of a relationship and then started working with them and did my PMBIA levels one and two that year, uh, maybe one, two and three that year. Fantastic. So right through the one, two and three in the first year. I, did, I can't remember if I did... Yeah, I don't remember exactly. It's impressive, how it went, dude, because the, the ride is one part. You're ex- hugely experienced rider, but then being able to to demo to all levels, but also be able to teach all levels. That's that's impressive, dude. I think the ski racing background, like being coached so much uh, at like a high level in that sport, yeah, translated pretty easily to like a, sort of naturally to like a coaching style. Yeah, that's fantastic. Even though I didn't have any like, yeah, that much like training and biking it was and tell us yeah tell us about the coaching side of things so once you once you did your qualifications you got work in there for ride hub totally. um i know we're chatting a little bit about on our ride kind of sharing some some common interests and like why we love that job so much yeah but i'd love to hear you speak on that i mean it's just so cool to like get to like share the like learning of biking with someone in a way that is like safe that they feel comfortable with and that like you know, within maybe say a three or six hour session, like you can like walk away with, you know, tangible improvements for the rest of your life or whatever. And I don't know, it's just really rewarding to like see people progress and and to share that. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Like you're at work, but like it's so rewarding and, and it just, yeah, feels really cool. And you build like good relationships and yeah. Totally, so, so you're there kind of, Working with Ride Hub for a, for a few seasons, like group lessons, private lessons, all kinds of different totally. riders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like taking on a lot of the kids coaching side of things and running the kids programs, um, and so we would like work with the Ninja Gym and do half days. So awesome. Half the kids would come with us in the morning, and then we'd go swap the group. And okay. then So we'd be biking all day, like huge days on the bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with a ton of kids, and we'd just do like a few weeks of that, and that was really fun. And then did sort of found a group of kids that um, that was a bit more serious about it. Worked with them for another couple seasons, and they were called the Feature Creatures. Okay, Super right. Rad so group. like a progression group that you stayed with for more yeah. of a long term coaching program. Totally, like it's so good to see the next generation there. Uh, it is. Uh, and speaking of that, like we've just been out for a ride, and I think every second person we rode past, you're like, yeah. "Oh, hey, buddy!" Hey, buddy. Totally All these is. different people you've you've connected with over the years. So, yeah, went from from working there with Ride Hub, obviously learn heaps, lots of different programs. Tell us the story about like connecting with Yolan and, and starting to work with him. Yolan and I had a funny. It was really funny. Like, yeah, I was out riding Reaper guy. one day. Yeah. And uh, I came around the corner as you, like, roll along the bench into that sort of the classic technical right-hand rock corner yeah. on Reaper. Yep. And Yohan's, like, there in the middle of the trail with his camera uh, doing his thing, you know, like, hello, it's me, I'm here on Reaper. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, sweet, he's making a video, I'm just going to, like, I'll leave him his space and I'll just take that little cut-down line next to the tree there, yep. down the cliff, the French line. And I like rode down it, and Yoan was like, oh my gosh, can you do that again? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, and then I introduced myself, and uh, and I went and rode it, and then I did some other moves through to help, like, just for his video, because he was basically like there waiting, I think, for people to ride by and right. do the corner. So, so you randomly met and then became part of his video that day. I don't even know if he ever made a video out right. of it, but um, maybe he did. <laughs> That's so funny. I, I should go check, but. <laughs> But then the next day or like two days later, I was in, um, I had like was doing my PMBI level one and I was in Whistler lot five at like seven in the morning. And I like get out of my car and I'm messing around and Yoan rides like right by and I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing here? 
I was like, I'm doing my PMBI coaching thing. He's like, oh, me too. And then we were in the same group. Right. <laughs> and so we did like our level one bike instructor course together. Um, that and must it, have been a wild level one course. It was wild, you. yeah. And like Javi, <laughs> right. Javier Munoz Santos was the the instructor of the yeah. course. And Javi's also super rowdy. And then um, this guy, Sebastian Seb, was in the course. And um, Michael Sawa, who's like the cro athlete. Right. Representative manager guy. Um, I don't know the exact job title, but yeah, yeah. he deals with the, the athletes at cro and Mike's awesome, and uh, so it was this super, like, funny random collection. But yeah, and then and then we like, we're doing something, very like, I don't know, similar close by again, like a few days after, and it was like, oh, we should go biking sometime. And then uh, a couple of years later, we were working together. Yeah, what a crazy uh, crazy just, coincidence yeah. of events. Yeah, it was pretty funny. And like after that, we just kind of like sort of stayed in touch and rode yeah. bikes every now and again um but yeah, then he, he needed some help with one of his he's trying to run like a bigger group program mm-hmm. and wanted to to involve someone else so we connected and uh and have been working together since it's been super sick man that's so rad so what's it been like a, a couple of seasons now or one full season a little more than like all year this year and sort of the end of the season last year. So yeah, fantastic. I think we started in like August or September last year. That's awesome. So I think it's almost like every every second day when I'm out on the trails coach and I'll see either, either you or your out there as yeah. well. Yeah, totally. Always smiling, always having good times. It's so rad to see. And I guess kind of working with working with the higher end of riders, um, lots of free ride stuff, lots of kind of gnarly lines. Totally. Like that's always sort of where I've wanted to to go with my biking, especially like coaching, is to help people. You know, there's there's definitely a process for like riding a, a more gnarly line and doing so with, you know, as much doing so as safely as you can, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I just find that really interesting. And and I don't feel like I don't know. I feel like I'm sort of in a good place to like help people with that. Like, definitely. I've spent a lot of time doing that stuff, but I in no way like feel like I pressure people to like ride anything that they're not comfortable with. like I'm always like talking people out of riding gnarly things like, okay no no you don't have to do it today like <laughs> yeah no don't worry you can go ride a bunch of these other things and come back to it but I think I like that um I don't know it's just it's nice feeling like you can help people and I've received a lot of really positive feedback and you know like we had a, a pretty bad accident where someone had to they like got seriously injured and needed a helicopter evac and that one's really tough, right? Because you're like, shoot, are we like, are we doing something wrong? Are we pushing this too much? But the the sport is just going in that direction. And like someone else from our group, you know, reached out and said like, hey, I, we just want to say thank you for for being there. Because, you know, if you think about it, like all of us would still be there doing that same stuff anyways, just on like the advice of a YouTube, you know, um, video, rather than like actually being there, being coached and like, Totally. being helped so as much as it's like you know by pushing the sport and like focusing on like higher end riders higher end terrain you know those people are going to be doing that anyways and so we're still you know in in that respect making things safer which which feels good totally yeah it feels it's very worth very nice to be there with a qualified coach and someone that's first aid trained yeah that's for sure 100 percent. and like those people are people want to be riding this stuff anyways there's so many videos of like everyone doing gnarly stuff it's nice to sort of have those videos and then be able to follow up with like an in-person yeah like okay this is actually what it's like it's not just like la 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 crazy shit in the woods like <laughs> totally yeah it's good to get that first person perspective of like yeah like this is the process we go through we don't always say yes totally um that kind of thing and like looking back obviously you figured out all of this stuff somehow by yourself with yeah. your buddies um, i think the ski race you- training helped a lot yeah, I'm sure that was, that was some cool insight. Do you wish you kind of, you had some like mountain bike free ride training? So much. Like looking back on your experience, figuring it out? I mean, I did have like these little bike camps I went to when I was a kid and like I had some really good inspiration. Like there was a little bit of a mountain bike scene in New Hampshire, um, but just like not really where I was. There's like Highland yeah. Mountain Bike Park, that's like an hour and a bit away. Yeah. A couple other sort of like places, but um I went to this camp every year called Coyote Hill, a mountain bike camp run by this guy, Tom Masterson, who's super rad. Um, 
and we'd like build jumps and build drops and like yeah. do a bit of the like free ride stuff we'd like watch the new world disorder movies you know right. like it was yeah, yeah. it was super cool but it was like one week of my year right okay. and it was like there wasn't really enough knowledge and like bikes were too varied at the time you know like some kids are there on like hardtail clunker bikes yeah some kids are there with like the newest you know cove whatever dual suspension like downhill bike totally. so like not only do we not have a bike park or like shuttle trails it's all like these cross-country trails with tons of variety in bikes and kids ages and everything so like the camps were really good they just didn't have like a good solid client base that was like cohesive totally that must have been so tricky it must have been so tricky yeah. i'm looking back but like they did an amazing job and it was super cool to like um to have that because yeah. It exposed me to a lot of like you know i was a little kid but like i was i'd be like eight years old there and there'd be like this 15 year old kid on a mm. sweet downhill bike building this like 15 foot drop in the woods yeah, you know with like old tom's tools yeah. and then he finished it and then we were like okay well he's the only guy who's gonna hit it but everyone like got to go walk up it and okay. check it out and like i remember i ended up hitting that like two years later or something wow. so like there still was that progression. It just wasn't super linear and it wasn't always like easy to do. But yeah. Isn't that cool? Like getting so that cool. perspective of like, this is how you build a feature. This is yeah. how it happens. And then yeah, two years later, perhaps having enough exposure, enough experience to be like, I feel comfortable hitting this thing now. Just like wanting it too. Mm. You know, you, if you don't know about it, you don't want it, but like totally. seeing it, getting to like look off the top being like, I want to, yeah, it's Want often a great jump. way to like come up with goals, isn't it? Just like seeing something. Exactly. And I'd love to talk about this. We chatted at the start of our ride, you know, about your riding and about how you perhaps go about setting some different goals. Right. Can you tell us about, yeah, like your process there and then perhaps about how you work with students to help them set goals as well? Totally. I mean, I think as far as goal setting goes, you can have a few, you sort of need like a, you need to know if you've accomplished your goal or not. So it's like racing is nice where you're like, I want to, do X number of races this year and I want to place, you know, this well by the end. And to do that, I'm going to train this much and ride like, you know, that's, that's sort of like the traditional way I think that people mm -hmm. have done it. But free riding is a little harder because, you know, you might want to hit a feature or you might want to like make a video or something that's a little like, it's hard to know if you've done it well or like to the like enough to be successful yeah um but i think that's kind of the beauty of it is like it's not structured it's like you're going more for like a, a lifestyle approach to mountain biking which is if you do it well you can sell it but if you if you're like most people like me you know it's, it's you're just like oh i just do all my spend all my time doing this yeah and like pursuing it still but you know i always thought like to be a free rider or whatever you just had to like be good enough like you just had to hit a bunch of big enough features and stuff but really it's a lot more than that like there's you know that was it when it was like the original crew of free riders who were like kind of outcasty from all over the place you know you had like right. you know, matt hunter and like josh bender and all these people who just like they just hit huge stuff and you're like whoa that was crazy and they'd always had the video part you're like oh i guess if i just get good enough then i'll have a video part but but there's a ton of people thinking that so then totally. it's not just about being good enough you know like the next generation is like so good in so many different ways now you have to like have a profile like a social media account and like be very multifaceted in order to be a professional like now you're really just selling stuff um you're like a marketer or an influencer or something as opposed to like being the sort of face of a of a movement yeah, the industry has changed a it's lot changed and it's continuing to change really quickly, isn't it, it? It sure is. And it's hard to sort of know what you can do now to positively, like, ha have a positive impact on your future. But I think, like, you go ride your bike every day and That's get better. That's a great start, isn't you it? You know, like, if you're, if you're too, like, result-oriented, you know, your goals, they don't really necessarily take you in the right way. Like, I love that you touched on that and going back to even just, like, setting riding goals. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I've learned the hard way as well. If we're too outcome focused, you got to be process. We're not focused. Yeah, we're not focusing in the moment and, and doing the work that will point us towards that outcome. Totally. Yeah, it's um, it's just like your goal should be to love riding your bike, right? Like if you have fun every time you ride your bike, then you're gonna ride your bike a lot, and then that's gonna like 
feed into being good at biking, I think. Totally. And this is actually something I wanted to ask you. Like, I, I see you as like this unique guy in the industry that's like really high level rider. You've got your own crazy style, doing all sorts of different projects. Like, where do you see yourself taking biking? Like, in the next five years or the next 10 years? Like, where do you see yourself <laughs> going in the industry? I've been actually really like uh, struggling a bit with like the vision for the future because I sort of like always had this like, Okay, I just gotta like ride my bike every day and I gotta hit all the features that I've seen in Squamish and I, like I have to like play a bit of catch up. And I feel like I've I've kind of done that. Like I've mm. I've hit all the features that I've thought about more or less. There's a few little new ones popping up here and there, but like, you know, I've hit all the Garanga features, all the like drop and roll, all the big scary things, and then yeah. you're like, Well, now like what do I want? It's like I don't know. I just wanted to be here and now you're here, it's like, well, you know, I think what I want to do is like have mountain biking be my job. Mm. And so I think to do that, like, you know, for some like smaller goals, it's like bring more like 360s and backflips and like, you know, little things that I can work on at like the Nestor's jump or at the red jump or whatever. And like just hone those in and bring them into like, you know, bike park riding or build some more cool features but yeah i think there's certain things that i want to do but it's hard to know i love where you're going with that it's, yeah it's an, like weird interesting place to find yourself in isn't it like when you like achieve everything you ever dreamed of and then you're like what's next yeah yeah i and want to make more videos i really enjoy like making little video parts that are like kind of fun and like you know, working with some local businesses to like... Yeah, that's something we, we haven't that. touched on yet. Tell us yeah. about your latest edit. It's like, one of the, honestly, one of the favorite things I watched on Instagram this year, just because Sweet, it, was, it was creative and it was fun, it was different. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. You worked with the guy, Alistair. Yeah, my friend, name? Alistair Spriggs. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was super rad. He volunteered a bunch of his time and skills um, and let me jump in and out of his truck a bunch of different times like so you literally jump in and out on the mountain bike again yeah. if people haven't watched this one i'll put a link in the show notes it's yeah. what is it a minute and a half long it's definitely yeah, it's worth like, your time yeah a little over a minute um, yeah but like what was your vision in, in creating that you're like hey cool we're gonna make an edit pretty much that's it <laughs> that just like it? yeah okay yeah like all right let's make a little like you know, Al was, he does a lot of like snowboarding um, filming and a lot of photography, but I think he was looking to sort of expand his filming um, portfolio a little bit, like get yeah. some more experience. You know, I don't know with exactly what, maybe it's lighting, maybe it's just like style of filming or, yeah. or whatever. You know, we'd sort of come up with a, like a little jump or a, something to ride and then figure out different angles. and just a lot of like hitting it hiking up hitting it hiking up oh let's do it like this hit it do it again so for a, a, both of us it was like pretty experimental as far as just like you know what it actually takes to create a little edit like that and then we it was just kind of naturally came out to be like kind of goofy and yeah styled towards how i like to ride my bike totally i, I think it yeah Really it cool to see, like, well. yeah, lots of wheelies, lots of uh, parking lot stuff within yeah. the, the trail and the free riding uh, style there as well. I feel like it actually gave me, like, after watching it, I was like, oh, I have some more ideas about what I could do next. Like, okay, right. it'd be funny to do, like, a, a video literally all on one wheel. Like, Danny Mac did the, the wheelie video. Yeah. But I think it'd be cool to, like, do more of a shred it, but every like but like change up how you're on one wheel in as many different ways as you could so, like, jump from back well. to front front to back like just like adding other variations like cool stuff that i can't so, wait to see that one yeah maybe that'll happen it's really cool, isn't it? I, I love having this chat about like yeah like an experience of like feeling a bit like oh where do i go next mm -hmm. but then making some moves forward and like oh, I'll, I'll try doing some filming and then you're like oh now let's open up some more doors and maybe that's the direction you'll go down Totally. Like to achieve that outcome of making mountain biking your job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like something that's possible. So I'd like to do it, whatever it takes. Definitely, dude. I, th I think you've found your path. You just got to keep treading down that path. Just keep blindly stumbling. Yeah. Well, you got to that. It's like mountain biking. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's awesome. Yeah. Keep moving just forward. Keep, keep it going. Yeah, totally. It's good. Man, this has been a, a fantastic conversation. I feel like we've, we've covered so much. Yeah. As we wind stuff down here, a couple of questions I like to ask. Who do you look up, in, up to in the mountain biking world and why? 
Um, wow, like a lot of people. I mean, I'm always like, maybe looking up is kind of a funny way to put it for me in this, but like, I'm always watching the next generation. Yep. Seeing like, like, I don't know, just what, what the kids are doing, like how they're riding. Cause you know, like they're the ones who are really focused on like what to do in mountain biking. You know, mm. they're the ones who are like seeing all these different riders really well. So like, if you look at the kids, you can like pretty clearly know where mountain biking is going. So you're like, okay, totally. I can, I got to work on this to stay relevant. <laughs> it is amazing talking um, <laughs> to the, the kids around here, isn't it? Because they're crazy. Spending, like probably a hundred hours a week on YouTube. Yeah. They know everything about you. They know everything about y'all and about Remy. They're watching totally. all the videos. And I guess they've just got this giant bag of ideas and like what's possible and what they want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. And then like, yeah, watching some, like, you know, Seminok is one of mm. mine and many other people's favorite riders to watch, like style, tricks, just like creativity. It's amazing. And uh, does a good job of translating it via video. Yep. And then I think like, I don't know, obviously like, you know, Johan and Remy and Steve and like the whole sort of crew around here of of people who I've like really looked up to for a while and um, and like worked pretty hard to sort of like be a part of that community or that crew. And then Danny McCaskill is oh, another yeah. one of my favorites. Like that guy is just, uh, you know, he's got incredible talent and like his vision for biking is like, I really like how creative and unique he is. That's like, not exactly the way he does it, but his style inspires me to like be individualistic, I think. Totally. So, yeah, I, I like. Yeah, man. So I just much. like watching anyone ride their bike, you know, like BMX. I love watching BMX too. Like yeah. Brad Sims, Dennis Anderson, Prangenberg, um, Felix. Okay. Prangenberg, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, just like really creative and just like BMX is, is pretty core, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. You fall hard on concrete repeatedly. Like, it, I'm always inspired by, like, how tough those guys are and how they get up. And, like, just seeing their drive, like, motivates me to be more driven as well. And, like, you know, push past the, like, first bit of failure. Yeah, it's so cool to hear, like, drawing on inspiration from all these different facets of biking and then using that to fuel your fire. For sure. I love it, man. As we wrap up here, I want to give you the opportunity. Uh, is there any like sponsors or industry partners you wanted to mention on the podcast while we're here? I mean, yeah, there's some uh, some folks who've really helped me out, like NF Clothing. They've always been awesome, and uh, Coast Optics. These guys are, are killing it. I saw. It. Check out their new glasses um, and their relatively new goggles as well. Like those guys, they're based in Whistler, and they're doing some really cool stuff. Um, so, thanks yeah. to y'all. And then, uh, yeah, I think. You know, of course, my parents, they always, they're, they're everyone's number one sponsor. Thank you, really. mom and dad. So, yeah, I yeah, love I it. Gotta, gotta give them the shout out. And um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many people around who, who help support the community. And uh, yeah, Tantalus Bike Shop, they do a lot for me. They yep. just help me get my bike sorted in like 45 minutes before I ride. So awesome. <laughs> Legends, yeah. yeah. Rad people, um, yeah. Thank you certainly. to Tantalus for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm sure I'm missing someone but uh but thank you whoever you are <laughs> <laughs> fantastic dude look we've talked about all sorts of things here if there's just one thing you could give our listeners to go away and think about perhaps on the next pedal up what yeah. would it be oh ride with your imagination ah, i love that yeah yeah keep it fun and uh yeah always have fun fantastic dude that's it well thanks so much for hanging out this afternoon it's been an absolute pleasure thank you jake yeah it's been it's been awesome man i uh, i appreciate you having me on and thanks for your time What's up guys? Just one more thing before you hit the trails. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and don't be a stranger. I'd love to hear from you about any topics or any particular episodes that you enjoyed and even about any guests that you'd like to hear me have on the show in the future. You can find me on Instagram at the underscore mind underscore mountain. This podcast, mountain biking, and mindset are all things that are very close to my heart. So I feel super grateful to be able to share these conversations with you. So much love to you all for taking the time to listen. I'll see you next time.